Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman here with my good friend, David Zills, the apologist. We are, uh, we're, we're picking up on a second part of an episode. We're talking about sort of those three uh, key facts for the, the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. Uh, we, we talked last time that uh, it, it is a fact that, that Jesus died on the cross. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. You can you can prove this uh, e- even apart from the, the scriptures themselves. That there is historical evidence that basically anybody who is willing to reason history on the same plane that they reason any other kind of history kind of has to acknowledge Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now what? Yeah. So if Jesus was God, which we tried to make a case for, and if Jesus died on the cross, now we have a dead man that we're worshiping. And you know, for Christians, this is not hard because we kind of, especially if you grow up in the faith this is kind of what you it's what kind you of know thing. yeah but uh to people at least in the first century this is a little bit odd and i think to a lot of non-christians today it's a little bit odd um and so i think talking about the foolishness of christianity is worthwhile and when paul says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing does he somehow mean that we have to turn our brains off when it comes to relating to God. When Luther says in the his explanation to the creed that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit, does that mean that our reason's like over here and everything doesn't make sense? And so we have to sort of check our brains at our door and let the Holy Spirit kind of conjure up this faith in us that is unreasonable. And the reason this is important is because, you know, it may seem like dry theology, but if you're struggling with doubt and you want to know how can I have confidence in this, it's really important to understand what are God's expectations when it comes to how I relate to him with my mind. And it, is it something where Christianity is just total nonsense and I have to accept that and not try to use critical Don't thinking think too hard about it yeah yeah so um because you're going to take one of two approaches either you're going to say reason is opposed to faith and so therefore the way to deal with doubt is to just ignore it and and see how that goes if you're going to say that faith and reason are not opposed then you might try to reason um about faith and try to say it does this make sense um And then you have to ask, what are the limits to reason, Um, which is its own theological question. But but I think it's really important because it has to do with how do you deal with doubt? So I think we have to ask this question, are faith and reason opposed or what is the relationship between them biblically? Absolutely. So um, we mentioned in the previous episode, like our our catechism tells us that I can't by my own reason or strength believe. Um, and, And so it acknowledges that there is such a thing as reason. And there is such a thing as faith, but one won't necessarily get you to the other, although the other will help you with the former. So in other words, reason won't get you to faith, but faith can help you with reason. Yeah, so I think, um, I like to look at the the Pauline literature, the Paul's epistles, uh, Mm -hmm. and how Paul talks about reason. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 are important passages where he talks about how the gospel is foolishness. To those who are perishing, which in light of people like we talked about the non-Christian Greco-Roman satirist Lucian, how he made fun of Christians for worshiping a crucified man. That's just an example of what Paul was talking about. Um, But does that mean that it's reason that's opposed to faith or is there something more nuanced? And I think Romans chapter 1 sheds a lot of insight into this because if you read carefully and i think it's worth reading romans one and two slowly and kind of going back over it a couple times but if you follow paul's argument he says first of all god's existence and nature are plain to people um their reason can affirm it he says the problem isn't reason he says they chose wickedness or they've suppressed the truth in wickedness and their thoughts became darkened so if you unpack that the truth is there it's something you can affirm with reason but when your will is captive to sin you can't stand the truth because it condemns you so you suppress it and paul Mm -hmm. says their thoughts became darkened so in some sense the reason became less reasonable he's talking about non-jews who 
um, worship idols. Uh, he he has his own critique of Jews in chapter two, you know, to make the case that nobody nobody is right before God. Whether you have scriptures or not, we're all sinners. But the, here he's talking about people who don't have the scripture, but they still can see that God exists, but their thoughts become darkened because of sin. And so I think that's important that it's not reason that's opposed to faith. It's reason that's in bondage to the sinful nature. And I think that's a very important distinction when it comes to dealing yeah. with doubt. You're right, because and and we we all recognize this in the world that it, once you have a, a want that is strong enough, uh, you can always justify. You can always come up with a good reason why you should have it or why it's okay. Um, this 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 explains so many. Like you can look from the outside and say this is a terrible idea, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. The reason is is darkened by sin. Um, and so if that's the case, and and we are sinful, and we're approaching then a God who tells us you're sinful, I, I understand why reason would would sort of want to flee. Yeah, and this isn't something that um, we uh, Christians are not off the hook because we still have a sinful nature. We, you know, when we're baptized, we have a new nature, but the mm -hmm. sinful nature is still there, and we still sometimes like to flirt with it, and then we can justify it. And that's where the law is important to kind of remove the excuses and be like, no, 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 that you made this choice and it was wrong, and you know it's wrong. Um, and the reason for that isn't so then that we despair or shame and and stay there so that then we go to the cross. Like the whole purpose of that is so that then we realize we need a savior and can receive the comfort of God's forgiveness. But we love to make excuses because it's this false comfort that, well, it wasn't really that bad. And so that's what Paul's talking about is that reason becomes darkened because of sin. And so then the question is, what's the role of reason in conversion? And when Luther says, I cannot by my own reason or strength. It sounds like reason is somehow not a part of conversion, but I don't think that's accurate at all biblically. When you look at how people in the Bible talked to people about um, about, about Christianity, when you look at it, says Paul reasoned with the Jews from scriptures. He reasoned with them that reason because we're whole people you can't separate our mind from our emotions from our body it's not like part of us is saved and the other part of us is just kind of over here in la la land and so part of the holy spirit's role in conversion is enlightening that word from luther's explanation enlightening our reason saying oh this is true this actually makes sense and that's where apologetics can come in and so you know, if, if there's someone who says, well, I don't buy into apologetics because it's got to be the Holy Spirit, that's kind of a false dichotomy. If you look in scripture, there are people who used apologetic-like arguments to help people realize, oh, this makes sense, to kind of take away those lies that, oh, this other thing makes sense and Christianity is dumb. It When it, when you can enlighten the mind and say, oh, this, this makes sense, it then allows your heart to worship Jesus. Because it's I've heard... Um, it said, it's hard for my heart to worship or find comfort in something that my mind thinks is dumb. You know, so it, we all of us has to be converted, not just our emotions or our will, but also our mind. And so apologetics and the Holy Spirit can go hand in hand. Um, so I think that's important because um, there, when you're dealing with doubt, I went through a phase where I thought reason and faith were opposed, and I went through all sorts of mental obstacles to try mm -hmm. to deal with this. And it's it's very, very disheartening. And I think when you understand biblically that when you're dealing with doubt, the proper response is not to flee from your reason, but to run with your reason to God and say, help me make sense of this. I'm confused or I'm unsure. That to me is way more comforting because it means God wants to save our whole person. He wants us to be holy, wants us to be confident and reassured that this is real and it's not something that's a fairy tale. So I think that's that's deeply comforting. And it's not just abstract theology. It's, it's very practical when you're dealing with doubt, which we all do. Right. So our, our Lutheran theologians, we talk about the magisterial and ministerial uses of reason. Uh, so so what we say then is, is that it, you have reason, like you, you do. And Luther speaks about reason in two ways, that he'll, he'll speak about it as a queen, and sometimes he'll speak about it as, as a prostitute. Um, and, and it's just sort of who's in charge that, that determines it, uh, the magisterial, the ruling, the ministerial, the serving. It Does reason rule or does reason serve? Because when we have the scriptures, we have also our brains, they're not supposed to be opposed because it 
it's true. If it is true, then, then we can grab onto it. If we hold on to a, a magisterial use of, of our reason, what we say is we're smarter than God and we will use our brains to figure out what is real and what is not real. But if we have a ministerial use of, of reason, the, the reason given by God, we can say God is smarter than us. So let's, let's take our reason to the scriptures in the world around us and, and actually learn and see what makes sense. And like you said, grow in enlightenment and an understanding. And this is a good gift of God that actually strengthens faith. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about the limits of reason, which is a whole topic unto itself. And Christians have debated what are the limits of reason and the proper role of it in faith. But I think one thing that is comforting, at least as far as dealing with doubt, is that at least in a, in a Lutheran framework, faith is deeper than reason. And the reason that's important, it comes up when, in, in like the Lutheran view of baptism and things like that. But the reason I think that's important is because when you're doubting, or let's say it's an end of life where you're, you're, you might become brain dead or have dementia or things like that, if your faith is dependent on your reason, then what happens when your reason is struggling or just not there? You know, are you still saved? And so that's where the Lutheran idea, um, which isn't unique to Lutherans, that faith is God holding on to us, not us holding on to God, mm. is deeply comforting. And so I think those are the two things that I really want to emphasize in this episode are that when you're doubting, there are two things that are true that I think are comforting. One is you don't have to run from your reason to relate to God. You can bring your reason to God and say, I need reassurance that this is real because I can't live in a fairy tale. But the second thing is when your reason is struggling, God is bigger than that. And God's relationship with you is bigger than that. And he can hold on to you even when you're struggling to hold on to him. And so you put those things together. And I think that's deeply comforting. It, it doesn't remove the need to wrestle with doubt, which is very hard sometimes, but at least gives you comfort that God is faithful in the midst of it. And it gives you something to kind of hold on to as a prom as promises of God in the midst of that, that can give you hope that as I wrestle with this, God is going to help me and it's going to be a good thing that comes out in the end. Absolutely. So when we have these two things then faith and reason, uh, we, we get to recognize that God redeems both and then sets them to work together. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's great. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Yep. It's a lot of fun. Hey, have a good one. We'll see you next time. All right. You too.